All right. Yokoso. Welcome, everybody. Um, I was asked to review a um, to review this case, and I made all these lovely slides, and I thought that I would bring it to a wider audience. Um, and so this is the review of Simo Holdings v. Hong Kong U Cloud Link. It's a federal circuit case from a little over a year ago. Um, it's not the most influential case, but it, it covers a lot of material that we've discussed in other formats. Um, unfortunately, I'll be doing this by myself, so um, there won't be any uh, Japanese translations or summaries for this. Komenasai. All right, so the procedural posture for this case <clears throat> is that CMO sued UCloudLink for infringement of claim eight of this US patent in the Southern District of New York. And the district court judge that decided this case is Judge Jed Rakoff. Um, he is one of the most well-respected district court judges in the United States. I've known about Judge Rakoff for about 15 years now, um, ever since I was in law school. And I believe I know him primarily through his work at antitrust, but I might be incorrect. It's been 15 years, but uh, he's, he's extremely well-respected. And I'm mentioning him because his view for the district court is reasonable. He is not supposed to create new law. As a district court judge, he is supposed to follow his understanding of federal circuit law. And so honestly, if I were a district court judge, um, I hope I would make the same decision as he does here. Um, even though he's ultimately wrong. So in granting summary judgment for CMO, Judge Rakoff construed claim eight in two steps. In the first step, he considers whether the preamble is limiting. And as patent prosecutors, um, we know a similar case or similar situation arises in prosecution. Although this case is, of course, is about a litigation. And if the preamble is limiting, does it require a non-local calls database? Okay, this database is kind of the point of this appeal. And, um, and the, the, uh, the competitor's product does not include this database. So this is an outcome determinative issue. So as far as the preamble being limiting goes, Judge Rakoff answers yes. The preamble is the only part that identifies the physical components of the claimed apparatus. And we'll look at this claim on the next slide. And with regard to the second question, he says no. Under this Odico v. Um, IPS Corp case. And it's not limiting because the inclusion of the database would exclude embodiments from the specification. And he suggests reading the word and disjunctively as and slash or. And this is a reasonable alternative interpretation to defendant U Cloud Link's view. He thinks this is reasonable. He thinks that this is a logical basis. And then the Federal Circuit panel unanimously reverses him. Um, so, you know, it sounds like he's really wrong here, right? But in law school, we learn um, that, you know, maybe sometimes we count judges. And so it's actually a three one judge split, right? There's three federal circuit judges that say no, there's one district court judge that says yes. And so we're within a one judge um, balance here, right? If one of the federal, if it's a two one split at the federal circuit, you know, there's two judges on each issue. And Judge Rakoff certainly is at the level of an appeals judge. He, Again, he's very well respected. He absolutely could have been an appeals judge somewhere. All right, so what does this claim actually look like? Well, it's a mess. And we're only looking at the first part here. 
And we're looking at all sorts of colors and notes to try and make sense of this. So let's go through this slowly. <clears throat> the first thing we come to in the claim is the red underlined phrase, wireless communication client or extension unit. All right. The reason we're mentioning this is that this shows us the um, statutory class. This is an apparatus claim. All right. Now we move to this location of the yellow highlighted word comprising. If we look at the end of the claim here, these specific functions, we see a yellow circle showing the patentability of the claim focuses on these specific functions that I've you know, edited out of the claim. And between these two issues, it's questionable where the preamble is, right? Is the preamble, is the transitional phrase this comp word comprising, or is it maybe this word for? That's an issue we need to resolve. We also see the magenta highlighting of the phrase a plurality of, and it extends through here to the word and. And so this phrase, a plurality of, is introduces the central issue of this case. Are there a plurality of memory, processors in this blue circle, programs in the green circle, and the non-local calls database, that's this blue uh, underlining here. And again, this database is the focus of the appeal. And then we see some clues that we'll discuss later, right? We see this plurality of programs in green highlighting, which refers back to the green circle. We also see the plurality of processors in blue highlighting that refers back to this blue circle. Okay, that's gonna help us answer this question. All right, so is the preamble limiting. Here's how the, the so the, the federal circuit analyzes the claim in the same way that Judge Rakoff did in this two-step um, analysis. And first they hint that the composition of the claimed communication client slash extension unit, for example, the memory and the database and the processors and the programs are part of the body of the claim. I covered this in patent terminology session four. Um, it was different there related to the inclusion of the word comprising twice in the claim, but this is the same issue. This is a disagreement about the location of the preamble. Um, you know, patent terminology didn't um, address this case. That doesn't address this specific example, but it shows that in the real world, people really do argue about the location of the preamble. And in this case, they get it wrong actually, um, the parties do, according to the Federal Circuit. Specifically, the Federal Circuit does not address um, this issue sua sponte, right? They're guided by what the parties argue. But again, they hinted that the preamble begins with the word comprising. Still, the briefs from the parties believe, um, I'm sorry, the briefs from the parties show that they believe that the body is limited only by the specific functions at the end of the previous slide. Um, so yeah, patent terminology session four is after this, but I mean, I learned this, you know, more than 10 years ago. I mean, this is old stuff. Um, so I'm a little surprised that this was actually the issue on appeal. I mean, certainly the, um, the patentee might want to shift the um, preamble later. But for the defendant, this the defendant absolutely should have been arguing based on the, uh, the location of the word comprising. All right, so then the federal circuit agrees with the district court that the preamble must be limiting because the preamble supplies the only structure for the claimed apparatus, right? They totally agree with Chodrakov. Simo says it's okay that some of the preamble is limiting. But that doesn't mean all of the preamble should be limiting. Um, specifically, the database is not necessary to perform the specific functions on which the patentability of the claim relies. Actually, this is a really good argument. Um, but the federal circuit replies and they say, no, that's not true. Here, the database is intertwined with the rest of the preamble, which provides the only structure for the device. Okay, so this is necessarily limiting, um, at least as far as the 
database goes. And they don't really go through the cases upon which CMO relies. The federal circuit just says this is a different situation. There's no real analysis on this point. All right, so before we go any further, I have to kind of walk you through some US prosecution history. So previously, the USPTO considered the phrase and slash or indefinite. In fact, they still might, um, though I've seen it more, uh, seen it approved implicitly more recently. But I've certainly seen this rejection in the past. And the reason is that it's unclear whether it means and or or. And I'm sure it was indefinite before. And then previously, the USPTO also considered the, war, the word or indefinite. So I know and slash or was indefinite because it was unclear whether the word or was inclusive or exclusive. And so this might sound a little bit weird, particularly for our viewers that um, are not native English speakers. So inclusive or means A, so inclusive or for A or B means A, B, or A and B. Um, for exclusive or it's A, or B, but not both. Um, so for example, you know, if I eat a hamburger or French fries and I eat both, that's inclusive. But if I meant the exclusive or, um, you'd be surprised that I ate both. And so as support for this, you can look at this old MPEP site from, you know, 30 years ago, MPEP section 706.03D. And so therefore, at one point, standard American practice is to list alternatives as the phrase, at least one of A and B. All right, again, this is something we've covered in patent terminology. This time it was in session seven. And so these USPTO policies are what set up the super guide case in 2004. And in the super guide case, the federal circuit answers that the, the phrase at least one applies to each element in a list. Okay, so if I say at least one of A and B, that means at least one A and at least one B. You can't just have one A, no B, that doesn't infringe. Later, the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeals Board, follows super guide in this case called Ex parte Jung. And in that case, they note the inconsistent application of super guide. So what I'm saying is, is that although super guide was decided this way, patent practitioners didn't universally switch over to this kind of new uh, view. And cases were inconsistently decided um, or had super guide applied. And so they say, you know, the PTAB says that at least one at the USPTO means, at least one of A and B means at least one A and at least one B, you can't just have one A or one B. Um, and then they designate this as informative, meaning it provides a norm on a recurring issue. In other words, this is the normal treatment of claims at the USPTO now. Well, that's not the greatest of policy decisions because uh, A, it depends on your specification and examiners often do not read the specification and B, you know, a lot of examiners will interpret it as, um, you know, at least one of A and B could be just one A. And that's, that view is probably consistent with broadest reasonable interpretation, um, or at least a broadest reasonable interpretation for some cases. But then the PTAB D designates Zhang. Um, and so its influence is unclear, right? The PTAP says, oh, just kidding. That doesn't apply to, that's not the normal view of the USPTO anymore. And I, I, I don't know what that means. I don't think anybody knows what that means, you know? So we have to act like it's informative now. And so a lot of practitioners have switched over to at least one of A or B. Anyway, that's the patent terminology 
session today is this discussion of this case. And this case issues as a patent after super guide, but before Jung is designated as informative. Right. So this case is this patent um, issues under the regime of an inconsistent application of super guide. They have no reason to amend their claims to get this out. All right, so now we finally come to the question of does the preamble require a non-local calls database? So the federal circuit just follows super guide in saying at least one of applies to each element as a general rule. Here it's different, right? It's a plurality of, but that's the holding of super guide. We're going to apply that rule here um, or apply that rule generally. All right, but what about this case in particular? Okay, here there is no article an article is a word like a or the, preceding the phrase non-local calls database. Okay, so what they mean here is that if the claim said a non-local calls database, then the uh, preceding phrase a plurality of might not apply to the database, right? It kind of sets the database off from the rest of the list. Secondly, the claim recites the plurality of programs and the plurality of processors, right? Those are the green and blue highlighting that we, I showed you on slide four. And so because there's these, this um, hint that the plurality of applies to both the programs and the processors, there's no reason why a plurality of should not also apply to the database. So there's your answer, but what about this OD case? Right, that's what Judge Rakoff, um, according to the appeal, that's what he relied upon. Um, and specifically, the district court had concluded that requiring the database would contradict the specification. The federal circuit qualifies the OD decision. They say that the probative evidence here, specifically the reasoning on the previous slides of this presentation, indicate that the exclusion of an embodiment without a database, right? We're going to require a database um, because of all this other evidence. And, and then they consider whether or not, you know, there's any exceptions. And they say that the specification does not disclose an embodiment without the database is preferred, right? They don't say this is a preferred embodiment. Um, I think it's, kind of an interesting question as to whether or, or not um, it's inherently preferred, right? Isn't a less complex um, embodiment often preferred for some reason, simply by merit of it being less complex? But the federal circuit doesn't address that. They just say, you know, there's, I mean, and there are, there's obviously advantages to having this database as well. So I guess there's also, some preference towards having the database. In addition, the federal circuit, um, this is not the situation, says that this is not the situation in which a particular embodiment would otherwise be unclaimed, right? There's this idea that if there's an unclaimed embodiment in the specification, I'm sorry, if the, if the claim seems to exclude an embodiment in the specification, maybe we want to, you know, the claim should be construed as covering that because we want the claims to cover the, the breadth of the specification. But the federal circuit says that's not the case here. Other claims protect an embodiment without the database. Claims one, 16, and 19. And so this is not a situation where the databaseless embodiment is unclaimed. It is claimed in these other in claims 1, 16, and 19, but we're discussing the infringement of claim eight. And claim eight requires this database, I'm sorry, requires these two data, plurality of databases. And then as kind of this final um, issue, the Federal Circuit says it's not utter nonsense to require two databases. And they cite this Zhao case um, coming out of. Uh, Judge Rakoff's district. Um, it's a little bit strange to require two, but um, you know what, what's the benefit of having a second as opposed to a first? 
but you know, again, this I guess this isn't considered nonsense. It can happen, um, and they find this persuasive at least uh, by virtue of you know coming from the same district. Although Zhao is not a federal circuit case, and that concludes it. Um, there was no infringement. Ultimately, here's how you can contact me. And thank you very much. <laughs>